So if you look back on some of the iconic images of Formula 1 history, you're probably going to come across some cars flying in the air or something. And these are all pretty much from the 1960s when things were just so damn awesome when it came to motor racing. Even if a, uh, a lot of people died. But hey, we're here to honour those drivers and what they achieved. So let's have a look at the 10 best drivers of the 1960s. Now back in the 1950s video, I know I said I wouldn't rank these guys, but eventually I just thought, eh, f*** it, let's rank them. Number 10, Bruce McLaren. Founder of the British Formula 1 team that dons his name, Bruce McLaren was a driver whose legacy still exists to this day. I mean, obviously. McLaren became the youngest Grand Prix winner in history after winning the 1959 United States Grand Prix, a record he would hold until 2003 when Eyebrow Man won the Hungarian Grand Prix. Once the 1960s came around though, McLaren started to hit his stride. Whilst he never had a proper crack at the title, four wins accompanied by 27 podiums suggest that this guy was no slouch. Number 9, Jochen Rindt. Even though Jochen Rindt was nationally confused, with the German running under an Austrian license and when asked what he preferred to describe himself, Himself, he said, European. Huh? He nonetheless demonstrated his ability behind the wheel, especially when the 1960s drew to a close. The 1966 season was where he demonstrated his skill driving for the Cooper Car Company, achieving an array of consistent performances as well as three podiums to take third in the championship. Once he found a competitive car with the Lotus team in 1969, he began to make his mark on the pace front. He would eventually take his maiden championship win the following year, but I mean, like, that ain't in the same decade, so we'll save that for later. But anyway, he helped popularise motorsport in Austria even before Nicky Lauda hit the scene. And when you watch him drive, it's easy to see why. Number 8, Phil Hill. Phil Hill holds the distinction of being the only American-born Formula 1 world champion to date. And before you say, what about Mario Andretti? I remember where that guy was born. But yeah, Hill excelled at sports cars with three Le Mans victories to boot. But his career in Formula 1 is very impressive to say the least. Buoyed by those results in sports cars, Hill started his Formula 1 career in 1958, driving for Ferrari toward the tail end of the season, collecting two podiums. He continued to amass some good results, including his first Grand Prix win at Monza in 1960, but 1961 would be his year. Although Wolfgang von Tripp's unfortunate demise ultimately gave Hill the title, both drivers were evenly matched throughout the season. Hill was certainly a worthy champion, but following that season, Hill really never regained the urge to race as hard as he did before, in Formula 1 at least. Number 7. Dan Gurney. Racing in the 1960s, the name Gurney was something that drivers feared, for uh, more reasons than one. It says a lot when the great Jim Clark describes you as the only competitor he truly feared. That was the case for Dan Gurney. Gurney's legacy in the sport extends beyond his driving skill, of which he wasn't found wanting. Whilst his machinery sometimes saw him on the side of the road, his four Grand Prix victories showed the world he was a capable driver. He also was the person who began the ritual of spraying the champagne rather than actually drinking it, and the first driver to use a full face helmet in Grand Prix racing. An inspiration to many American racers, Gurney's legacy in not just Formula 1, but motorsport, is why he'll always be nestled in amongst the greats of the sport. Number 6, Denny Holm. It's one thing to be characterised as a bear, but Denny Holm had the added bonus of actually looking like one. But the gruff nature of the one they called the bear did little to hinder his accomplishments. Having raced sporadically during the previous season, his first proper season in Formula 1 came in 1966, replacing Dan Gurney as Jack Brabham's slave. He finished on the podium in every race in which his Brabham could be bothered to finish. And then the following year, he would go on to win the World Championship after a string of consistent performances, beating out his boss to become the first and to date only World Champion from New Zealand. Number 5, John Surtees. I can go on about Surtees for a while, but instead I've enlisted the help of Mike from F1 Fanatic. Thank you for having me on to talk about the great John Surtees. Now John Surtees started his motorsport career back in the 1950s on motorcycles, where he would dominate the 500cc category in the late 1950s and become a four-time world champion. In 1960 he would make the switch across to Formula 1, and this is obviously where he puts him in the category of greatest drivers in the 1960s. In only his his second Formula 1 race he would secure second place position at the British Grand Prix before in the next race going on to score pole position at the Portuguese Grand Prix but it is with Ferrari that John Surtees achieved his greatest success which is becoming a Formula 1 world champion and he did this in 1964 so with John Surtees 
you know, he was an absolutely brilliant champion. Maybe he should have been a multiple world champion in this category, but the biggest compliment you can give him is that he is the only person in motorsport history to be a world champion on two wheels and four wheels. Certainly a great of the decade. Now back to you, Josh. Who's up next? Well, number four, Jackie Stewart. Jackie Stewart is remembered in the world of Formula One for a couple of reasons. One of them is through his indomitable urge to make the sport safer, which you uh, couldn't really blame him for as drivers were being killed on a semi-regular basis back then. And the second reason for why people remember him was his incredible ability behind the wheel. And considering the context of this video, let's focus on that last bit, shall we? Stewart came into the sport in 1965 driving for the BRM team alongside Graham Hill off the back of an impressive Formula three season. Stewart would take his first Grand Prix win that year at Monza, and by this stage was looking good to take the runner-up position in the standings over Hill, but he would eventually have to settle for third overall, which wasn't great, but I mean, hey, it's still third. After spending two seasons struggling to make sense of the BRM reliability, Stewart then switched to the Matra team and found himself in more comfortable territory. He would eventually win his first world championship in 1969, with more to come in the following decade, but, but you know, that that's for another time. Number three, Graham Hill. Graham Hill's wit, charm, and mustache made him a popular character back in the 1960s. Something else that made him memorable was his raw speed. To date, he is the only winner of the prestigious Triple Crown of motorsport. Unless, of course, Lord Ego here gets his way. Winning his first world title in 1962, Hill then finished runner-up in the following three seasons. He was incredibly unlucky in the final race of 1964, however, when Lorenzo Bandini came over all Italian and rammed him from behind. And this probably lost him the world title to Surtees? But you know, that's sort of motorsport. It's not unusual for people to lose a championship in the last race, you know what I mean? But he would bounce back to win the 1968 season with Lotus. Of course, it was wasn't without its issues. Lotus race cars back in the day had a reputation of falling apart if you so much as looked at it. After a crash at the 1969 United States Grand Prix, Hill broke both of his legs and kind of halted his career. But when asked if he wanted to pass a message on to his wife, he replied, just tell her I won't be dancing for two weeks. Seriously, th this guy was just awesome. Number two, Jack Brabham. As mentioned in the previous video, Jack Brabham was about as skilled with the spanner as he was with the steering wheel. In other words, he was really damn good. After winning the 1959 title, Brabham started off the 1960 season by retiring through gearbox failure. Uh, okay, not a good start. But then at the Monaco Grand Prix, he would only complete 40% of the race before being disqualified. Again, not, not a good start, but once they got to the Dutch Grand Prix, that's when Brabham started to run away from the field, winning that race and the following four to take a comfortable championship victory over Bruce McLaren. Founding his own constructor in 1962, Brabham went on without a victory for four years, but then came 1966 when all the stars aligned from him, taking his third world championship by some margin over John Surtees and cemented his legacy in the sport. And now, for some honourable mentions. Number 1. Jim Clark Was this ever in any doubt? For a lot of people, Jim Clark was not only the greatest driver of the 1960s, but the greatest that ever lived. And it's not without reason. His championship victories is reason enough to think that he's great, and his winning percentage of 34.25%, which puts him ahead of Lewis Hamilton, Michael Schumacher, Jackie Stewart, and Ayrton Senna would make anyone believe that this guy was a great driver. But some of his performances he put in were otherworldly. You want an example? I'll give you one. In the 1967 Italian Grand Prix, Clark had put his Lotus on the pole. He led the field away and it looked to be an easy victory for the Scot. That was until a puncture forced him into the pits. By this stage, he was a lap down and on a track like Monza? <laughs> yeah, good, good luck getting that lap back. Well, guess what he did? He tore through the pack, went under his pole position time and retook the lead ahead of John Surtees and Jack Brabham. However, he ran out of field just before the line. He eventually finished third in that race, but that performance was worthy not just of a race winner, not just of a championship winner, but of the best driver of the 1960s. So who's your pick for the best 10 drivers of the 1960s? You guys know the drill, comment below, keep it respectful, be wholesome, don't be a manus, and as always, I'll see you all later.